Okay, folks, welcome to the 15th lecture, and uh, we just finished talking about orthogonal complements, and now we're going to move on to orthogonal projection onto linear subspaces. And after that, we're going to have a brief introduction on what are algebras over the field, over the field. Okay, so let's start with a definition that what is it orthogonal projection? So given an inner product space and a subset of V such that it is finite dimensional. Why we require the finite uh, dimension to be finite? Because we here that makes the function orthogonal projection of V onto U the function be well defined. Why? Because it takes V equals to U plus W to U, where U is in U and W is in U perp. Right, we know that we require finite dimension to have v is equal to u plus u perf. We need u is the dimension u is finite. Okay, so here we just take v equals to u. Okay, takes p u v to u. So here are some a list of observations. First observation is that it is an operator on v. Now let's verify this really quickly. Can we on v2? Right, we have a decomposition of v1 and decomposition of v2. And we take their sum and we can regroup them like this, right? Which means that p of v1 plus v2 is equal to u1 plus u2, right? Because we say that we remember that as long as we have a vector in v, that is equal to a vector in u plus a vector in u perp, then this decomposition is uniquely determined, which means that by definition, this is, is our uh, pu of v1 plus v2. But u1 is equal to v1, u2 is equal to pu v2. Right, so it is as desired. And to check the scalar condition, Right, lambda is just equal to this, which means that, right, which is uh, this is equal to right lambda v, right. Okay, now the second observation is that for any u and u, p u and u is equal to u, right. Well, since u is equal to u plus the zero vector in v, right. And same similarly. Um, for w in u perp, it takes w to zero because w is equal to zero plus w, right? Zero in v, right? And fourth definition is that range of p u is equal to u. Well, I think this should be trivial, right? Observation, and the kernel is equal to u perp. Why? Because if v is in the kernel, right? Then v is equal to zero plus w, right? Because p u of v is equal to zero, which means that v is equal to zero plus some w, but w is in u perp, so v is equal to w and v, so v is in u perp, right? And also for any w in u perp, p u w is equal to zero, right? So to prove this condition is for this one, this one's for this. And this one is for this. So they're equal. Okay? Yes. And V minus P U V, so it, its difference is in U perp for any V. Right? Because V is equal to U plus W, which means that V minus U equals to W is in U perp, which means that V minus, by definition, V equals to W. In U perp, <laughs> and this is a, a kind of uh, important or interesting property is that P U V the norm is always less than equal to V for any V and V by Pythagorean theorem. Why? Because um, P U V plus W, right? squared is equal to p u of v squared plus 
w squared, right? This is by Pythagorean theorem, right? And this is less than or equal to um, sorry, greater or equal to a single PUV squared. And this thing is equal to V squared. So V squared greater or equal to PU V squared. T take off the square. So uh, we have the desired inequality. <laughs> right, it's straightforward. Okay. Okay, so now we have our knowledge on projection. We can uh, review, revisit the raised representation theorem. So the statement is that for any finite dimensional vector space, okay? Now we require the vector space to be finite dimensional. <laughs> also, it is an inner product space, okay? I kind of didn't wrote it out, but V is also an inner product space. And for any V and V, For any phi v, for any phi v a linear functional, we define the phi v linear functional that takes u to the inner product of u with v, right? For any u and v, so we define this a linear functional in this way, and the representation theorem states that it takes v to phi v, right? It is a bijective map. Okay, so this map is a ve is a function. I'll say, let's call it, let's call it, it's from V to what? To the uh, dual space, right? It's a bijective map, okay? And if V is over R, then it is linear. So it's a homomorph uh, homomorphism. Over C is not, right? Uh, you can check it by yourself because if we're like swapping something, there's like conjugates and something happening. But R and R, R conjugate is equal to R, right? <laughs> okay, so basically, for each V, we associate a linear functional, and this map is bijective map. First, we prove that it's surjective. Uh, we prove that it is surjective. To prove that it is surjective, well, first, for any linear functional, if the zero map, then it's equal to phi zero, okay? So we assume it is not a zero map. Then kernel, it is not equal to V, right? If it's not zero, then the kernel is not entire space. If the kernel it is not entire space, which means that it's complement and it's not just a zero vector, right? So from this, we can just let a non-zero vector w be in the the kernel complement, okay? Kernel complement, complement of kernel, <laughs> complement of kernel. Now we define v in this way, okay? We define v in this way. Why are we defining in this uh, expression? Well, first it is in the complement of kernel, and v is not equal to zero, right? Because why? First, um, v is not zero. This is not zero, right? Phi of w, w is not in kernel, right? W is not in the kernel. Because if you're in the kernel complement, then you're not in the kernel. Because w is not a zero vector. It is not a zero vector, so it is not in the intersection. Only zero vectors in their intersection, right? If, it is not, if it's not zero, then it's not in the intersection. W is not in kernel, which means that this is not zero. So this is not zero. So this is not zero, right? And W is not a zero vector, right? Which means that Z, V is not a zero vector, okay? And it is in kernel com uh, complement of kernel because, because you can view this as a single alpha W. Right, it is itself a vector subspace, right? So it is closed under scalar multiplication. So V is in the complement of kernel. Complement of kernel is itself a linear subspace. <laughs> okay, so now we take the norm, we take norm on both sides, 
we take no on both sides which gives this this right this this boom boom we have this left and 5e e, if we apply phi on both sides we observe that phi of w phi of w right and we have um this multiplied by its conjugate which is equal to this well again right this and this observed is equal to v squared norm squared okay so 5v is equal to v norm squared so for any u and v we have u is we can write u in this like this right 5u equal to 5v 5v and this right it's, it's the same thing but phi of this thing phi of this thing is equal to zero why can anyone tell me why <laughs> okay so let me tell you guys because um which is because um, this is equal to phi u minus phi u phi v phi v right is equal to zero okay so this is equal to zero which means that um it is perpendicular with v right why is it? because v is in what v is in v is in kernel complement but this is in kernel kernel but v is in kernel complement so they are perpendicular right it should be clear so their inner product should give you zero i mean no 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 i mean their inner product should give you zero and the inner product of u with v right inner product u of v which is inner product u of v which is the inner product of this with v right this entire thing here and uh, this is perpendicular with v so this with v gives you zero which is left is this is this right so this and v right but this and v notice that we have a scalar in front and v v right which is exactly this thing and this is norm square norm square cancel equals to phi u so uv is equal to phi u right right <laughs> which means that for any u and v and a product of u and v is equal to phi u <laughs> but this is equal to phi v of u, right? Phi is equal to phi v, right? <laughs> so our logic here is that for any linear functional, right? For any linear functional such that it is not zero, then we have um, the phi is equal to phi v for some v expressed like this for some v like this so phi is equal to some phi v phi is equal to some phi v okay so it's subjective to show it is injective so if phi v1 is equal to phi v2 then like u is v1 minus v2 right then u v1 is equal to u v2 in a product from this we induce that v1 might if you don't believe me right is equal to v1 minus v2 v2 right so this gives you v1 squared minus v2 v1 is equal to v1 v2 minus v2 squared right So, 
if we move everything over there, we have v1 squared minus um, v2, v1 minus v1, v2 plus v2 squared go to zero. And continue, we have, well, this expression is basically the same as v1 minus v2, v1 minus v2, right? Because v1 dun dun minus v2 v1 minus v2 v1 minus v1 v2 v1 and negative v2 negative one conjugate is equal to negative one right and this this which is this right? so zero is equal to v1 minus v2 squared norm squared as desired right so. It is a bijection. Okay? And now we move on the problem of minimization of distance. So for any finite dimensional u, subspace of inner product space v, we have this. So v and the perpendicular, the projection, so v has the minimum distance with the projection among all the u and u's. Okay? <laughs> That, well, this can be interpreted like geometrically. We have a space like that, right? If you consider the projection, right? This point and other points, right? This thing, d, d is the minimal distance for any v minus u. For any like this is like obviously greater than d, right? This one greater than d, right? And this proof is one line proof because this is less than equal to, um, I'm sorry, this should be a squared, right? So this squared is less than equal to itself plus another non-zero stuff, non-zero quantity. And from here, we have Py Py Pythagorean theorem because V minus PUV is in U perp. Why? V minus P U V is in U perp, right? We've showed this above. And P U V minus U is in U. Right? P U V, P U V is in U. And U is in U. So U, both vectors in U, their linear, linear combination is still in U. <laughs> right? So this is in U perp. This is in U. My Pythagorean theorem, this cancel out. This, right and this is a simple a simple one so i'll live for you to prove it it's very easy to verify okay and okay now we finish the orthogonal projection and we're going to finally introduce you what is in algebra over in a field r f okay so we've been discussing about what our vector space is over in a field and an algebra over field F is that it is itself a vector space, but we have to find a new a multiplication of vectors in it. Okay, so we add another structure which is called uh, vector multiplicated multiplications, right? Such that it satisfies these four properties: it is associative, it is distributive, left and right distributive, and is it works well with the scalar product. Okay, so this addition is vector addition, and this is scalar multiplication, and this is vector addition, okay? So notice that we didn't require the multiplication to be commutative, right? So if they're commutative, then we say it is a commutative algebra. And if there exists a multiplicative identity, then we say A is a unital algebra, okay? An observation that if the unit unit is unique, if it exists, right? So to verify is that if u and u prime both unit, then we multiply u and u prime. So u and u prime is gonna be equal to u prime, and it's also gonna is equal to u prime because u is in the unit. And it's also gonna equal to u because u prime is the unit. So u is equal to u prime. 
So it is unique if it exists. So we give it a notation called 1a as a unit in a, okay? And some examples, some good examples, the, uh, the vector space of continuous function from 0 to 1 to r is a commutative and unital algebra. Right. If we define a function, if we define f times g of x is equal to fx times gx. This is multiplication on c, 0, 1, r, and this is multiplication in r. Okay. Um, yeah, it's a commutative, right, a unital algebra. The unit is the identity function 1. And the set of square matrices is a unital but non-commutative algebra unless the dimension of V is less than equal to 1. Okay? I mean, unless... Sorry. It was unclear. It should be unless N is equal to 1. Okay? <laughs> I was saying the dimension because I always relate uh, matrices with operators on vector spaces. Right? So, yeah. Yeah, so here it comes. Operator of uh, vector spaces. We define their product to be composition. And it is a unital algebra. Right? The unit should be clear. It is the identity map, the unit. right? And it's not commutative unless dimension V is less than equal to 1. Mm-hmm. From here, why is this true? Because we can relate the operators to a matrix, right? Matrix multiplication vector, vector. I mean, sorry. Uh, the composition of linear maps, which is the same as uh, T2, uh, matrix multiplication, right? If it's a one times one matrix, one times one matrix, A times B, which is equal to same as B times A, but is not committed unless this is the one, okay? And the trivial case is left for you to discuss, like there's a trivial and it's only zero vector inside, right? So good. Some remarks. For V B finite dimensional, we can fix some basis and any operator can be uniquely determined by assigning values on T on the spaces, right? So we have a bijection here. For T, we have a bijection on T zeta one, T zeta n, right? And recall that we can also form a matrix of T with respect to the basis. We call it MT, okay? So phi from L1, this, takes t to the vector uh, to the no take the vector our vector is operators to the matrix of t and this map is a unital algebraic homomorphism high by oh my god okay let me just copy from my lecture notes all right let me just say let me just say it here so for a b algebras <laughs> a map from map between algebras is an algebraic homomorphism if it preserves all three operations. Right? It is a simple one, right? If it preserves all three operations. And if A and B are both unital such that it takes the unit of an A to unit the unit in A to unit in B, then is it it is a unital algebraic homomorphism. And our statement here is that it takes operator to the matrix. This map is an unital algebraic homomorphism. Okay, it's a unital algebraic homomorphism. It's very easy to check, right? We just check the T1 of T2, right? Phi of T1, T2, which is phi of T1 of T2, right? Which is a matrix of T1 of T2. But remember how we define matrices, right? Right, which is equal to phi t1 times phi t2, right? And it is unital because it takes, 
it takes it takes the identity on v to this right okay so now we give v an inner product we assign we equip we equip v with an inner product on it well which is still finite dimensional and by grand schmidt we can let it be an orthonormal basis a v right and now we associate a matrix and we have this formula holds the i jth entry which is t zeta j and a product with zeta i let's verify this t zeta j we know that by our definition of matrix t zeta j should be equal to the jth the jth in uh the jth like column right the jth column of the zetas right alpha one j theta one plus alpha n j theta n. now we take this in a product with theta i Notice that it is an orthonormal basis. It is orthonormal, which is orthogonal, right? So the only one which survived, which is ij. But this is equal to 1, which is equal to alpha ij. So alpha ij is equal to this, okay? All right, so this is a self-introduction. I mean, not, not self-introduction, I'm sorry. It's a short introduction. Well, which is also a self-introduction of algebra. Right. Algebra gives himself a self-introduction of what I am, right? I'm a vector space, and I also have another multiplication defined on myself, such as uh, these four properties. It works really well with other operations, and we didn't require any units. We didn't require it to be commutative, right? And we also define what are algebraic homomorphisms, right? It preserves, it works well with all the three operations and unital algebraic homomorphism is that it maps unit to unit right? it is possible that maps unit not to units right sometimes some it could happen right well if we can't say that it maps unit always to the unit right it's just algebraic homomorphism right this is not required like if this happens we call it a unital unit algebraic homomorphism Okay, so we're good, All right? This is a short introduction, and I'll see you guys next time.